associate professor. I thought I'd clear that up. Um, change. What can I tell you about change? Change involves doing something different, doing something different than what is, different than what exists currently. And it also can involve going against resistance. I started thinking about giving this talk, and I thought about what I was doing when I was your age, in my 20s. You are all so exceptional and ambitious. And I was an undergraduate student uh, at Acadia, actually, at Acadia University. But then I quit university to live in a van. <laughs> I quit university, I moved to London, I became a bartender, I bought this van with three other girls, and I lived in a van, and I traveled throughout Europe. My parents were thrilled. <laughs> Very thrilled. Yes. Also, in my 20s, I went to Costa Rica with Youth Challenge International. I built a turtle hatchery for all of Ridley turtles. I built a water filtration plant. I learned how to bricklay, how to bend rebar. I went to mountaineering school in Washington State and learned how to be a guide. I was a ski instructor and a bartender in Whistler for a number of years. I did finish my degree. There was money passing when that happened. Um, I graduated from Acadia with a degree in kinesiology, but then I had to make a change. And I had to make a change out of desperation, essentially. I had a huge student loan, and although my last name is Cash, I had none of it. <laughs> it's true. So I ended up working for medical companies, building custom seating for people in wheelchairs, and then I went on to work for multinational companies selling medical devices to plastic surgeons, vascular surgeons, and hospitals. And that is how I ended up in Haiti. I went to Haiti in 2005 with a medical team to help build rehabilitation equipment, and that was the moment that I experienced another personal change in my life. I was standing on the side of the road in a very impoverished area, all of Haiti is impoverished, essentially, and I met eyes with a woman who was on the second floor of a building, a Haitian woman, and we just looked at each other. And it was at that moment of 20, 30 seconds that I realized the incredible privilege that I had growing up where I did, in Nova Scotia, in Canada, because that opportunity allowed me to get an education, that allowed me to get a job that actually paid off my student loan, and I had health care, I had a lot of services that, if you're born in Haiti, you just don't get that privilege of having. So I went back to Canada, and I quit my six-figure job, and once again, my parents wondered how I would end up surviving. And I, I took everything I owned, which was a surfboard and my skis and my mountain bike, and I lived on my friend's couch. I was 33 years old, and I decided to go back to school and do international development studies. And then I went on, and I did a Master's of Environmental Studies, and then I did my PhD in planning at the University of Waterloo. But that is how I ended up in places like this over the last 12 years or so. This is an informal settlement in Nairobi. Informal settlements are called informal settlements because the people who live there don't have a formal right to be there. They're constantly at risk of being evicted by governments. They don't have services like water delivery or sanitation. There's no garbage removal. So the people in those communities really have to be self-determined to make changes in their community. This infrastructure project was created by women in the community who came together and saved their money. They make about a dollar to two dollars a day, found partners, and created this project. The Black Tower holds water. They rent the bottom space out to a woman who does hair. The round structure is actually toilets and showers. They collect the waste from the toilets to generate energy for a kitchen, 
And then the top is rented out as a community hall. And they do their laundry there and hang it on that wooden structure. It is individual people who do not have formal education who are making significant changes in their communities every single day. So now I'm at the Cody Institute at St. Avex, and my research focuses on how people who live in informal settlements and coastal communities are adapting to the changes in climate. And this is how I ended up in Manila in December. I was there doing research with this organization called the Philippines Homeless People's Federation. This organization started in a community called Payeras. This community is in a landfill. The shacks, people's homes, are located in the landfill. People who live there are waste pickers. They pick the waste and they recycle it or they build something out of it. They might make art out of it and they sell it and that is how they make their living. So the federation that I'm talking about started here. In 2002, um, there was an explosion in this landfill. There were heavy rains that year. It mixed with the gases in the landfill. An explosion happened and the garbage went over the homes. The official estimates were that 288 people were killed. The people who live there believe that there are around 1,000 people who died, and that is because there's actually no official records of people who live in these areas. There's no census that is done or anything like this. So the people in that community have had to come together to ensure that this doesn't happen again. One woman told me that she was standing there and she watched her pregnant friend get buried by garbage and die like that. So now this group from this community created this federation. And now they go to other communities around the Philippines, teaching people about how to improve their communities with the resources that they have how to purchase the land that they're living on from government, how to purchase it from private sector owners. This is um, Ophelia. She is from that community and one of the founding members of the Federation. And she's talking to people who are doing the reblocking pro project. What they have to do is convince people to cut off a portion of their already modest homes to widen the streets so that emergency vehicles will be able to get through if needed. But people who live in informal settlements, these communities that people call slums, actually try to make a conscious choice every day to make a positive difference. They beautify their homes. You walk into one of their homes, I refuse to call them a shack, because they have pictures of their families and inspirational quotes are on their walls. They decide every day to make a positive difference. This is Tess, she's currently the president of the Federation, and she's showing me how high the water used to flood in her community. But because the women got together and raised money, they've put in stormwater management so that the flooding doesn't occur anymore. And so now these communities are responding to the changes in climate by working together. This is one community that I visited, and the water here is very deep. It doesn't show it, but it's people fish in this area. It's over my head. It's very deep. This used to be a field, and then the flooding started, and water began to rise. And now people have to build their homes on, a sh on stilts. So they just keep rising their, raising their homes up. And, but the people in the community raised money to do things like build this amazing community hall, and it's completely climate-friendly. Climate, uh, it has a solar panel to generate energy. The blue barrels collect rainwater. There's a toilet inside, which is wonderful in a community like this, and the waste is collected underneath the building in a bucket. This is their sidewalk. 
But every day, people who live there try to make their community better. And it's mainly women who are doing this. The men are typically elsewhere working and sending money back home. So it's women who don't have a formal education, who have learned things like engineering, architecture, urban planning, how to retrofit their homes for climate change. And the organization now is talking to young people because young people who are born into informal settlements are the most vulnerable in the world. Not unlike our Canadian North, really, because they have to deal with such difficult things at such an early age, sometimes it's difficult for them to have hope. But by talking to them and, and showing them that they can make a difference, that things can be different, this is how we educate the next generation and create the next generation of change makers. So what have I learned about change? Well, you do not need money to create positive change, and you do not need an education for a formal, uh, or a formal education to create positive change. If you have the privilege of having those things, then I encourage you to use them. But what you do need to create positive change you need to be strong, you need to be brave, and you need to be courageous. Because sometimes people won't like it when you're trying to create change. People want to keep things as it is. So it will be really difficult sometimes for you as you go to make change in the world. One woman told me that she used to be very shy and quiet before she started advocating for the rights of homeless people. And then she had to become more outspoken. She had to get up in front of people and talk to them. And her husband didn't like that, and she became beaten because of that. And this is, sadly, somewhat common. Other husbands were very supportive. But one thing that they've really taught me is that really important to laugh to find humor in every day, to try to find something enjoyable about what you're doing. Because it's really, really important to look after yourself, to look after your mental health and your physical health, and to look after yourself as you start to make positive change. And I really believe that all of you here are going to do that. Thank you.